Cool. Before I jump in, I, I wanted to throw a slide in there. I know we were talking about it earlier, uh, but uh, Kevin was a pretty awesome dude. I know some people were mentioning comments in the pre-show banter about the impact that he had. Uh, I was in middle school, high school when I first met him, and there was this big movement that started that is what put him on my radar, which was the Free Kevin movement. And so I got a bumper sticker if, that said free Kevin down here on the bottom. And it was just kind of what brought awareness to him and his situation and what he was going through at the time. And I, I still remember when he was walking out of prison and he was carrying his, um, his, some, some files and he was walking and smiling. And that's really what, um, what I remember him as <clears throat> him and I have been pretty good friends over the last few years specifically. And, um, we just had some really good conversations recently. And so I mean, even outside of tech, um, just about life in general, he was a really awesome dude. So um, just wanted to kind of throw that shout out in there. Um, so, but yeah, so free Kevin. And so about me, uh, I've been pen testing for a long time. I kind of got my start in offensive security in the late 90s. There was a vulnerability called CGI bin PHF. And it was this um, just this local file um, include type vulnerability where you're able to read local files on the machine and you could dump like Etsy password. And so it just like inspired me to move in the offensive realm. Uh, and so during that time frame, I was also dealing with um, bulletin board systems. Uh, many of you know my dad already. And so he kind of grew up introducing me to these um, BBSs, which were bulletin board systems. And we used to go to the local meetups and try to hack the back doors because a lot of the BBS back doors um, were in the software. And so you could basically compromise the sysadmin of, uh, or the sysop is what we called them, of the BBS. And so I got like this fascination with it. There's a lot of good research out there if you're interested in that, in some of the roots of that. Uh, you could do like certain keyboard sequences and um, it would pop open like uh, sysop access. And so it was super cool. I started developing in VB3. Uh, it was a, a friend of mine uh, that introduced me to writing um, progs for AOL. I didn't do the AOL stage. I kind of jumped over it, but that's kind of where I got my development background. And so in my career, I really been focused on um, pen testing since 2005. And, uh, and I see Fletch in the comments saying about uh, wow, with Hacking Fest, it's actually interesting because I'm talking, I'm not going to give it away, but there's a lot of really old school content that my dad and I are going to be attempting to talk at while we're second fest. So if you're interested in this nostalgic view of InfoSec before it was InfoSec, uh, just come while we're second fest, shameless plug, uh, and come check out the talk. So it's pretty much just me. Uh, I'm just I'm mainly on the offensive side. I'm not really good at the blue side. Um, so agenda. Well, what I wanted to do is, you know, we're going to talk about remote desktop protocol. That's the, the, the elephant in the room. I didn't kind of put it in the slides right away. Um, besides the the title of it but what we're doing is we're going to walk through my hunt for a new initial access method as you know on a red team initial access is the difficult uh, step in our world nowadays it's not like it used to be five ten years ago it's a lot more difficult and so trying to find trying to find new initial access vectors is um, is where i kind of wanted to start this and then we'll move into how do we leverage initial access as a ruse, and then I'm going to bring it from a twist. So it's going to be a little bit backwards. If you're familiar with remote desktop protocol and what it's used for, this is going to be a little bit backwards. So I need you to kind of take off your traditional hat and put on a, a different perspective because it can get confusing really quick. I'm going to try to walk through it the best that I can. And then we'll talk about server side payloads. And yeah, since we're bringing our own server and we're bringing server side payloads, it makes for a really good blind on the visibility side. So endpoint protection is likely going to make it um, a little bit more tricky for them to detect this kind of stuff. I do have a recorded demo. I wanted to just kind of step through. It's not super crazy, but um, it'll show you kind of what it looks like from a deployment perspective and then also from a user interacting with it perspective. And then I'll have some closing thoughts. And, um, and so if you have questions, feel free to drop them in there. I'm going to try to save some time for the end for either discussions or answering questions. And that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of this engagement or uh, this engagement, this presentation. And so the hunt for initial access. So we're talking about Windows here. And with that being said, I really wanted to investigate the default Windows programs that get launched with certain extensions. 
And so in order to do that, I had to do a little bit of research to figure out what type of built-in Windows commands that I could use to print that list of this program gets launched with this extension. And so by doing that, um, there's, uh, there's a couple of different ways you could do it. In the screenshot that I have here, there's this an association command. And what I do is I'm leveraging PowerShell and I kick off this association and it goes through for each of those extensions and shows you the executable and the file type. This was important because I needed to really understand those default programs because from a red teamer perspective, we need to know how do we weaponize those default programs and how can I generate a list really, really quickly. And so I did some just hackerish stuff, you know, it's not anything super cool. It was just some crappy commands. And then it generated this list and I literally went through every one of them trying to find some sort of cool program. And I found RDP, which, as you know, does some really awesome functionality for Windows. And so these are the two commands. The first one just gives you a list. But what it does is it kind of um, it generates a extension file. So basically it takes all of the associated file extensions and generates a file and then saves it to the disk. And so now you have a bunch of really random empty files that are in a folder. And so I just went through and started clicking. Um, and I noticed that RDP obviously launches MSTSC, which is the, the terminal service client. But Microsoft RDP is really unique because email clients allow RDP to pass through. Uh, security gateways, email security gateways allow RDP files to pass through by default. And email providers allow RDP files to pass through. And security endpoint product products allow RDP files to execute. At the bottom here, I provide a few links for Outlook, Office 365, and even Proofpoint, which will show you which attachments are blocked by default. And you'll notice that RDP is not in any of them. And so it makes for a really good target as it relates to targeting a Microsoft Windows environment. And so moving into that, what can we do with RDP? So if you used RDP before in a real world environment, you'll know that a lot of environments create a Windows server, they set up some application that launches, and they share that RDP file across the organization so that they could just manage one endpoint and have all of the users kind of connect to it. And when they connect to that RDP server, what they're doing is they're forwarding their local drive to the RDP server so that the RDP server can access the client's disk drives and their audio, because if it wants to play audio or record audio, or if there's USBs, you wanna be able to forward that USB port to the server to interact with it. There's video capture devices. There's even network file shares. So if you think about this from a corporate environment, what happens when a Windows server or Windows client joins the domain, it automatically maps network file shares. Sometimes it maps to small and it becomes a mapped drive on that local machine. Well, when you connect to a remote server, if the RDP file or the MSTSC connection has drive forwarding enabled, those network file shares that are mapped also get forwarded to the server. And so you have all of these components now that are accessible from the server and if we could find a way to launch our own, bring our own server and have a client connect to us, we have access over their disk drives. And so that's what we're talking about here. And not just read access, we also have write access to that user client's drive and mapped folders. So if they have write access to a network file share and it's mapped to a local drive and it's forwarded to the RDP server and we run our payloads, we can write to network file shares. And the other really cool thing that RDP does for a, a client is if you're wanting to copy and paste on a server, it forwards the clipboard content. So Steve and I, Steve Boros, everybody knows Reverse Shell. Steve and I were, I, I was showing him this technique whenever I, I finally had it weaponized. 
And one of the cool things that I did was I sent him the RDP file. And so obviously he's not just gonna run an RDP file from his machine, he, for, especially from me, knowing that it's weaponized. So he goes into his virtual machine and he launches his RDP file. Well, virtual machines forward clipboard content as well. And so what ended up happening was I was able to break out of his virtual machine, steal his host clipboard content and capture that from the rogue server. And so it was, it was really just this eye-opening initial access vector that we really started to try to figure out um, how to really continue with this weaponization. And so we can also print to client printers, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in a second because there's some cool stuff with that that we can, we can leverage. And um, client cameras, if they're USB, and then there's one other, there's a few remote code execution techniques that we can leverage. And so we're gonna look into the, some of this, and this is where we're going with this technique. And so what we have to do in order to, to weaponize this is we need to convict, configure our MSTSC client, you know, our remote desktop software. We open it up and we, we set forwarding on everything. We set the printer on everything. We hard code our username at our server. We'll talk about that in a minute. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna save that as an RDP file. With that being saved as an RDP file, um, and we send it, we can send it through any mail client and to any mail client. We can bypass all email forwarding. It's gonna fly through all the security gateways. It's gonna bypass EDR. And if we have a good route, it's gonna be executed by the client on their machine. And so that's the, um, that's the focus of how we're going to weaponize this. Um, and so we need a really good initial access roost in order to kind of do that. Now, as you can imagine, getting a client to execute an RDP file through email can take a little bit of, uh, of thought. You have to really think outside the box here on how you can do that. And so uh, that's what we're going to put together, and that's the initial access roost. And so in order to have a good roost, we need to entice that user to connect to us. It absolutely has to look 100% legit. It should not raise any red flags. And a good initial access roost on a red team is going to try to have some sort of controllable deconfliction. Because you know if we send it to a client and a, a target client and they see it as a red flag, or if they execute it and it just all of a sudden just disappears, well, that's kind of risky because now they're they're gonna think to themselves, well, I wonder what that was that I just ran. Why does it not give me access to the application like they said it would? And they're going to go alert it, and they're going to send it up upstream to their uh, to their SOC or to uh, their incident response team. And so we want to really try to gently, after we do all of our our bad stuff on their machine, we need to gently send them on their own. Like, go away now. We're done. We're good. We want to let them down slowly. And so if you're on an internal network, it's a little bit easier because you can plant these RDP files um, in that customer environment. We'll talk that in a second, but uh, and it's a little bit easier uh, because it's, you know, you're on your internal network and, and um, dropping files and like a network file share and sending a link is easier than sending an RDP file. So uh, that's what we're focused on, on our roost here. And so this is one of the ones that I like to go to. And so this is just like a, a Citrix workspace fake email. Uh, and it's it's built off of the real Citrus workspace email, at least when I generated this template. I haven't checked it to see if it's been updated lately. My verbiage in this is obviously going to be slightly different than uh, what Citrix workspace would send. But what I like to do is I like to set up a domain, like a remote access domain that would look like it should be some sort of a remote application. And so I use Citrix workspace I, and I try to match it for my target's environment. So during your reconnaissance, you're gonna to wanna to see if you could identify any external hosts that might demonstrate what software they're using for remote access. Sometimes it's Citrix Workspace, sometimes it's other, um, other competitors of Citrix, but you really wanna get your roost to match that because that's gonna be what they're used to connecting. Now, how they're going about connecting might be slightly different, but as long as you can match the technology, you'll be in a really good spot. And so the other thing you want to do is um, you, you want to pave out the message to be creating the urgency for them to actually connect. And so in this one, 
I'm inviting them to this shared workspace. We are testing this new environment and we need your help immediately uh, because we need you to verify that you can connect so that we don't avoid it, so we can avoid any sort of service disruption. We provide the RDP file in the email. And so all they have to do is connect. It's going to automatically connect and they need to do it by a certain day. That way we get that urgency. In the event they're unable to connect to that remote workspace, we want them to either click a link or contact us. We don't want them to contact anybody on the organization. So we wanna provide that information to them. So that way we're letting them, letting them know what they're gonna expect. They're gonna connect automatically. Once they connect automatically the server, I'm going to have a background image on the desktop. So whenever they connect, it says, hey, your connection is being tested. Once it's tested and successful, you'll automatically be disconnected. and You don't have anything else to worry about after that. It's going to automatically close out for you. You don't have to interact with anything. You're good to go. That's what, that's the ruse. That's what I like to use. That's how I, I do it. And so with that being said, um, the delivery, I like to just use email. It usually makes it the most believable. I could put the email together. Uh, and the reason why I like to use email is because I like to spoof. Spoofing really enhances the, the, the legitimacy of it, especially if you're spoofing their domain and you're spoofing a um, sysadmin or someone that they would expect to receive an RDP file. You could use social networks, you could use Slack, you could use Microsoft Teams. You really, they all really pretty much just let that RDP file fly through. So you really wanna think outside the box on how you're approaching that. Uh, Microsoft Teams chat is awesome as well. There's some really cool uh, spoofing of Teams where you could um, you could spoof teams and send messages and um, and drop RDP files that way. And then once again, I mentioned internal networks. Um, network file share replacements are beautiful for this technique. So as as we're stepping through, think about that from a, from a network file share perspective. Some how many times have you been on a red team or an internal pen test where you've maneuvered through network file shares and you found RDP files? So if you have a writable network file share that you can replace that bad RDP file with your real RDP file, you could still force them to connect to the real server. And we'll talk about why in a second and still man in the middle of that connection. And that's what we're gonna dig into here in a second. And so it's, it's really kind of cool. Um, I'm just throwing this in there because I already had it in there. Um, so the spoofing technique that I was talking about was something that, uh, that Steve made uh, public, or I think it was already out there, but he made it more prevalent. Um, him and I were talking about this direct send spoofing. You could basically spoof uh, Office 365 targets by connecting to the mail connector directly. And it, if they're misconfigured, it allows it to kind of fly through. Uh, and so I'm throwing that slide in there, but I really want to talk about it from here. You basically just got to grab the Microsoft MX record. You could use an NS lookup to do that. Uh, and then you can connect directly to the SMTP server for the domain dash, whatever the domain is, dot mail dot protection dot outlook and you could just send your email as long as you're spoofing a legit user at that domain to a legit user at that domain and you can attach attach the rdp file i would say that spam house has been blocking my home ip address when i'm doing it from my house a lot more lately but uh steve showed me this cool technique where if you connect into azure and you use the cloud shell within azure you can do the same thing and it'll be sent from a Microsoft IP address and it'll bypass that spam house thing. It was super awesome. That's usually what I'm going to directly now. I don't even bother trying to send it from my home because spam house. So that's the way to do it. And you attach it and it's going to, it's going to light up and you're going to be good. So let's talk about the server now. So the windows server we have to bring has to be just a standard windows server. I'm working on some techniques for not having to bring your own server. But I, the Windows protocol for RDP is so complicated that I, I genuinely don't understand it. I understand bits and pieces of it. I've tried to dig into it. It's very complicated. I, I have one slide to kind of show you all of the protocols and encryption algorithms that they use in order to kind of do it. Uh, but it's complicated. So right now, the way that we do it is we bring our server. You enable remote desktop. I know it's super bad. You're exposing Windows Server RDP to the internet. No, you're not. We're going to fix that. But you do want to enable RDP. You want to open the RDP port, but you don't want to expose it to the 0.0.0.0. You want to um, open that RDP port to another host that we'll talk about here in a second, because we're going to spin up a proxy server to man in the middle of all the traffic. 
And then you're going to add your new user and you're going to grant that new user RDP access. I do change the local port down there at the bottom using um, some PowerShell and uh, modifying the, the registry. But that's the nuts and bolts of all you really need to do this in order to bring the server. But you have to have those enabled because our proxy is actually going to connect to the server. I know it's crazy, but when we send it to our victim, our victim is going to connect to our proxy. Our proxy is going to forward that traffic to our server. And that's where this goes. I have a, I have a, um, a flow graph that will discuss this more in depth. But you have to enable this in order to do that. Now, some some catches here. I tried to do this a million different ways. I ran into roadblocks. I had people tell me from other teams that I used to work for that um, this probably wasn't going to happen, and it's probably there's too many headaches. Well, I don't like I don't like hearing no. I'm going to keep digging in and digging in and digging in, and I had to just go through this one by one. The first one was this big ugly yellow. I can't stand the yellow warning. The publishers um, can't be identified. So what I wanted to do is back in the day, like I don't know how long ago it is. I, I didn't find how long ago, 15 years ago, easy 15 years ago, maybe 20. You used to be able to send RDP files and you could store the credentials in the RDP file where they would just automatically connect to the RDP server and not have to log in. You could also set the Windows server so that the Windows server would allow users to just automatically open up RDP without having to like log in. All of these were in, in modern Windows environments were not possible anymore. Microsoft has done a really good job at kind of showing that stuff up. RDP files can't store credentials because it uses DP API to put those in the, the computer where they were saved. So it would work for my environment, but if I send you that RDP file, you're not gonna have my DP API credentialed um, to be able to de decrypt them in order to connect to the server. So didn't work. Blank account passwords did work. I could set my, my RDP user for my server with a blank password, but they still had to hit enter in order to send that blank password. So you have another step for the user. This has to be super seamless where all they do is open the RDP file. I don't want any hiccups. I don't want two steps, three steps. I don't want any of that. And so that didn't work. And the other thing is when you have a blank password and you expose it, like obviously we ran into issues where before I had my man on the middle server, I would I, I tried it this way, but now you have a, a Windows server online that the blank password, you don't want that. The other thing is these yellow banners on the RDP file look super sketchy. Like I, I probably wouldn't connect if I was being fished just by that yellow banner. I mean, if I'm seeing a regular legit connection with that yellow banner, I'm going to call it into question. So because of the file publisher. And then the other thing is most people say, well, this would never leave my network because I have port, you know, 3389 blocked. Uh, so they, a remote desktop would never leave my local network to go to your remote server sitting in the cloud. We wouldn't allow that. That's fair. It's a fair argument. So this is what I had to deal with. <clears throat> so in order to get around this stuff, I needed to become a, a trusted publisher. I want to man in the middle, the victim, and I want to run my own server. I do that, and now I can preload any username. So I can make the, the target organization the username or the, the Roos application the username. And I can use any domain that I want. Because what I'll do is I'll go register a really good looking doppelganger domain. I'll generate my SSL certificate. I'll, I, I found some really quirky ways. There's probably a better way to do it, but I found some quirky ways to use Let's Encrypt on the .com domain to sign my RDP files. So it looks like it's a signed publisher, nice and beautiful here. And then I wanna set the man in the middle server to listen to any port that I wanna listen to. So I can listen to RDP on 443 using my my men on the middle server, which bypasses a 3389. And when they connect out, they're connecting over 443. I'm connecting to whatever port I want on the back end because it's my server. And I'm doing all of the militia stuff uh, there. And so that's how I did it. That's how I was able to get the yellow to turn blue. And now all I got to do is send a signed RDP file. And so in order to get that signed RDP file appropriately, I had to figure that out. 
And so I use the Let's Encrypt to do all of the, the normal SSL certificates. So you get your, your certificate chain, you get your private key, you get all that stuff. And so the way that I've been doing it um, is on Windows Server. I do have some stuff that I'm not dropping in this webinar, but um, John Strand has um, really convinced me to open source Rogue RDP, some of the infrastructural automation to get this up and running without having to go through all of this. So I'm working on that. I didn't get a chance to have it completed by this because as you can see, it's a lot of moving pieces. But I do this, this is, I'm, so I'm giving you the baby now and then I'm, I'm gonna provide you a solution um, soon on how to do it automatically. So you wanna install Coco, which is gonna give you the ability to install OpenSSL and Python 3. You're gonna use Python 3 to install CertBot. You probably used CertBot before to generate Let's Encrypt certificates. But you're going to generate that doppelganger domain certificate, and, and so you'll have a, a valid domain with certificate. You're good to go. You're going to use OpenSSL and convert that certificate into a PFX file. Because with the PFX file, you could import that into the certificate store on, on a Windows computer. It doesn't have to be on the server. It could be anywhere, but you're basically wanting a Windows environment because there's a tool on Windows called RDP Sign. And so when you import it into the cert store, you're going to get the certificate thumbprint, which is basically the identifying thumbprint for the imported cert. With that, you're going to apply that certificate to the RDP file, um, and you're going to use um, the, the built-in tool RDP sign to sign it. It's going to ask you what algorithm you want to sign it for and what um, what thumbprint do you want to use to do the signing? And so with that being said, you'll have a signed RDP file. As long as you don't modify it after you sign it, it will always be a, a verified uh, publisher. And so for the man in the middle part, this is, gets a little bit more complicated. So now we have our server running, we have everything's enabled, we have our domain set up because we need to move those certificates. And we'll talk about those certificates because we're going to reuse them here in a second. But now we need to set up our proxy. Our proxy server is going to be our man in the middle server. There's all kinds of crazy protocol stuff. I'm going to summarize this with it's complicated. It's running all kinds of um, algorithms for encryption. It's got virtual channels so that you could have um, disk access, hardware access for like printers. It has other uh, virtual channels for clipboards. There's all kinds of crazy bitmap bindings because as you can imagine, you're taking a uh, user interface from the server and pushing it to a client. So there's all kinds of weird bindings there. There's authentication, there's encoding, there's a fast channel and a slow channel. Um, and so I started down this journey and realized it was super complicated and I really needed to find some pre-existing work that I could leverage because I didn't have a, uh, the ability and the bandwidth to continue down this journey. Luckily, um, there was, this is the protocol, this is what I was showing you. I'm just throwing it in there. Uh, but I found this article from GoSecure, who are amazing. And they introduced this tool called PyRDP. It's, all it does is man in the middle. And it was used for a canary. They wanted to, to try to drop some rogue RDP um, files out there so they could have uh, attackers connect to their their man in the middle server. Actually, they weren't using it for man in the middle. I don't think they were using it more for simulating a real world scenario, um, but it was awesome. It's this amazing man in the middle tool, and but it monitors clipboard content. It hijacks all the, um, the clipboards. The same thing that we were talking about. It snags files from their local machine. You could, um, and there's and all kinds of cool stuff with it. So you could listen for whatever domain that you're using. So you can, you can set it up where it's listening on the port that you have mapped to your domain, for instance. So set up your virtual server on like a Linux host, um, enable PyRDP, point PyRDP to your SSL certificates that you just registered for that domain that you use to sign the RDP file. And it has implemented the majority of the RDP specification um, kind of built into it. And it also will forward them to a server, to a real server. Now, normally they used it for like legit servers. I'm using it for a rogue server. Same exact stuff though. 
the other beauty behind it is you can have Pi RDP configured to really authenticate. And now your server, all you got to do is set up the, the firewall rule to allow your server to connect to that um, Windows server, or your, I'm sorry, to allow your man in the middle proxy to connect to your Windows server through the firewall. That way you're not exposing it to the internet, you're only exposing it to your, uh, your man in the middle proxy. And your proxy will authenticate, so you don't even have to worry about the user entering in any credentials. You can put any credentials in there that you want, it'll just automatically connect them and authenticate them because it's happening on the man in the middle um, client. This is the command that I use in order to kind of just do it. Uh, you pass in the real RDP, the, the private key as a flag. Uh, let me see here. I have, let's see if I have this here. All right, I'm still good. Uh, just checking to make sure my headphones didn't die, sorry. Uh, you pass in the real IP, you pass in the, the private key and the cert, the real Windows Server user and password that you want to authenticate with. This is in the listening port, so if you're listening on something else um, that you want to listen to. So I usually listen on like 443 or something like that. It'll set up, and then now that RDP file is going to connect to the man in the middle proxy. The proxy is going to handle everything else, and you are good to go. So that's the, the, the man in the middle. So hiding the malicious code. So now we have our server, we have everything ready to go. Now we need to talk about the malware. So remember, we're running malware from our server. Their endpoint protection software can't monitor code execution on our server because we brought our own server. What can we do when a user automatically logs into our Windows server? Well, we can run whatever code that we want. It's our server. So we plant our malware to listen at RDP server logon. So whenever that user authenticates, and there's other ways to do it, you can enumerate all of the client information. There's all kinds of valuable information. You can get their local IP address, their username. You can get their display settings. There's a lot of awesome client information that you can get. But what we need to do is we need to plant something on their, on their computer because we have right access to their computer. We have right access to their network file shares if they have that enabled on their, um, on their ACLs. We could plant in their startup folder. We could plant DLLs for sideloading. So if you are used to sending like a, um, a zip file with a DLL or something to plant uh, for like Microsoft Teams DBG help, if you're wanting to do any sort of sideloading, my favorite is to look for executables on a client machine. So I have some software that will look through all of the executables on the, this, the client computer, check to see if they're .NET binaries. And then if they are, I could just inject my app domain manager into their .NET config and drop my, my DLL payload in that same folder or in another folder. And whenever they run that real tool, it's going to inject my app domain and then kick off my payload. Um, the other thing you could do is you can look for sensitive files. So if you know you're targeting like a, um, a Azure admin, well, they probably have the hidden Azure folder or an AWS admin. They have the hidden AWS with their tokens. And so you could steal all of that and exfil it because all you're doing is copying files now because those files are mapped from their client to the server. You're just literally executing a copy file. And so if in order to do that, they're mapped. But the way that you do that is just like a network file share, you could put the domain, but instead of putting the domain, you just do backslash backslash TS client backslash C. It'll actually interact with the, the terminal service client's C drive instead of the Windows server. And so you could basically start enumerating users and do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, it's going to avoid most of the detections. Now, if you're interacting with files that are file canaries on that client, if you're reading a file that shouldn't be read because it was a canary file from Red Canary, well, obviously that's going to trigger a detection because you're interacting with a file that you shouldn't be connect interacting with. Um, but for the most part, if you're writing to um, their Windows startup or something like that, obviously there's going to be detections there. But uh, you have to think outside on how to get code execution. There's a lots of ways that's outside the scope of this conversation. Um, but I kind of wanted to just talk about that. So. With that, uh, let's talk about server side loop payloads a little bit more. So one thing that I've done is I wrote my tools in C Sharp because it's a Windows, it's super easy. There's a library called Cassia. Cassia is a SDK for C Sharp that allows you to write code that interacts with terminal service clients, which is Microsoft RDP clients. 
So it gives you the ability to enumerate all the session info that I talked about earlier. There's some other information about their Windows build information if you wanted to kind of capture that. So my rogue RDP payload captures all this and it stores it because if I'm using this, I just blast RDP files at times. If I'm not like, if I'm on like a phishing engagement or some sort of social engineering, what I'll do is I'll send RDP files to everybody and then they'll start connecting and then I'll log all of their user info. So I know who actually connected to my, my rogue server. Um, and then once they're done, you could use Cassie and you could just force this connect to the server. You don't even need to keep them around. You, you come, they, they connect to you, you enumerate what you want, you expel what you want, you plant what you want on their computer, and then you kick them off. That way they're, they're ready for the next one. Um, and so there's the, uh, the TS client. So if they have their network file here mapped to like their F drive, you would just access it with this, this backslash backslash TS client backslash F. Now you're on the network file share. And so if you wanted to start looking for like sysvol or local user admin um, hard-coded credentials or something like that, you can. Uh, I did start playing with RDP gateways because I've had the question, well, what about RDP gateways? There is some ways you could do that, but you lose the support for Pi RDP because it doesn't support RDP gateways. Um, and then the other thing that's really difficult is I'm, I'm really trying to research um, an unprivileged direct code execution method. I have one that I'm going to talk about in here that has since been patched, but if they're running out of date stuff, then you're still good. There's also other ways that you can actually execute um, terminal service connections. So Microsoft TSC has a COM object that's registered in Windows. So you can run it into a macro or an HTA. You can create and instantiate the COM object and then invoke the connection. You can even make it with a Word document and make it invisible so they don't even see it connected to the server. Um, so you would just create your macro, you'd create your COM object, you'd make it hard-coded, connect to your server and, or your your um, your proxy, whatever one you want. And uh, and then when they enable macros, it's going to automatically connect to it. Obviously, I don't want to deal with macros because I'm looking for a new initial access method, but if that's your way of going and you want to you do that, you could use a, the COM object. It's super cool. Uh, and then bear in mind, anything that's mapped to a virtual machine is also going to be in game for this. So I had a USB external USB that was mounted to um, my uh, my host machine and it was forwarded to my virtual machine. I was able to plant files and read files off that USB uh, storage. So uh, this is just a, a brief, simple Cassia explanation of the interaction with the host. I threw this in here just so you could kind of see how, how super simple it is to interact with these with some C-sharp code. And so for the sake of time, I'm going to skip through this, uh, but I just kind of wanted to show you that. And so this is the attack graph that's basically there. So the idea behind this is you're the red team sitting on the outside of the left of the circle. You're going to send an RDP fish to the victim's workstation. They're going to open it up and all of the mounted network file shares are going to be forwarded. It's going to be sent to the man in the middle high RDP server, which is external to their network over MSTSC. That Pi RDP is going to connect up to the rogue RDP server, which is going to do the interaction. Now, because you have interaction over the, the victim's workstation, you could plant your C2 binary and then also connect to your C2 um, server if you get the code execution. That C2 server obviously is going to be managed by the red team, and that's pretty much your, your threat graph. And so it's fairly straightforward. Everything that I told you so far, I, um, I'm just going to demo it here. And I'm going to try to do this. Uh, hopefully this works. Let me, uh, let me stop share real quick and then reshare because I think that's the easiest way to do this. Unless somebody knows a faster way. So, uh, when the screen is right here. All right, so my screen should be visible. I'm going to talk through this and I'm going to pause it. Uh, please let me know in Discord if we have any issues. I think we're good. But so the top window is the startup folder. The startup folder uh, is where we're going to try to write to. And we have this other mapped drive that has that file, rogue RDP file. This is a uh, a USB file storage that's mounted in the virtual machine. And then in the bottom is me. This is old, so it's not there anymore. So don't try to hack me. But it is my proxy. I already have the server running in the background. I'm not going to show that right now because you'll see it connect. Uh, so when you kick this off, all it's going to do is launch 
this Pi RDP. There's all kinds of other really cool features in there too. So um, I really highly encourage you to kind of jump in there. So what we have here is we have the private key passed in, this user's RDP, and then I have the super secure password. I also have crawl enabled. This crawl file or flag is for Pi RDP, and you can match it. You can pass it a list of files to match on the client's machine and it'll search all of them. And if they're there, it's gonna just basically steal the file off there. And so I have it set uh, for this rogue RDP. Um, and so it's, it's gonna kick off. Sorry, it's going slow. I'm, I don't know how to speed it up. I'm not good with this stuff. So it's listening on 000, 3389 in this case, but it could have been anything. Um, and so what I have on the desktop is I have this rogue RDP file. Um, and that RDP file is already signed. So my hope is that what we're going to see is once we kick this file off, I'm going to pause it and let you kind of see what we got here. But I'm going to edit it first. So the username's there. It's going to drop into the local devices. This is where you would set the printers and the clipboard and the drives. They're all checked. Uh, so because they're all checked and I have it signed already, it's going to connect to rogardp.com. It's nice and blue. So there's that blue screen. So the thing with this is once you sign it, you can't modify it. It blocks it out so you can't change anything, which is actually really good so that um, the end user doesn't actually go through and, and do anything that it shouldn't. Um, so it kicks off. Nice blue trusted. All they have to do is click connect and it's going to kick it off. Uh, that connection, you're going to see it down here at the bottom. New client connected. It opens up RDP. It's connected to the RDP server at this point. And so this is there's some stuff going to pop up. There's going to be some pop-ups. I left the pop-ups there so you can see that it's actually interacting. It takes a second. There's a pop-up that just came. It's doing some stuff on the client, and then I'm going to pause it here. So uh, the Pi RDP file was stolen. I want to pause it here because you'll notice that there's some new stuff here. The first thing that you're going to notice is that this binary planner.bat file got written to the startup. I just use this as an example. This could have been anything. So all they did was connect and it planted that RDP file. The other thing that it did is, if you look at the bottom window, it it stole and saved some of the output to this folder. I, I canceled it, that's why there's an error here, uh, but it actually is still it's still good to go. So that wrote the all of the output from the client, any file that it stole, uh, it stole, it had the RDP server there, and then it wrote this desktop LNK file. Now, I like to write an LNK file and what I do is I map the space bar to the LNK file. Because if they hit the space bar, it's going to launch the LNK file. And you can do whatever nefarious stuff that you want there because you just wrote there. And I just use the OneDrive icon, which is already on the machine. So I learned the space bar technique from uh, a guy that I worked with uh, at CrowdStrike. It was, uh, it was a super cool technique. I've seen people use it before, but I've never seen them use space bar. And it was just... He used it in a really cool way. He was a really smart guy. Um, did some really cool uh, techniques with with LNK files. I, I wouldn't want to give away all of the other stuff, but um, I map it to Spacebar. It's well known already, so it's not like I'm, I'm leaking anything. But it's some some cool techniques there. Um, and so you could map it. The reason why I bring that up is because you wrote the LNK file over a terminal service virtual channel. The LNK um, shortcut doesn't actually get mapped to NTFS, so the Windows the Windows machine. It doesn't map the spacebar until the computer restarts. So you won't get immediate code execution with the spacebar, unfortunately. But um, yeah, so that's basically what we're doing here. We, we run the demo a little bit longer. Uh, the bat file, all the bat file does is it just writes another file to the desktop. I'm just showing you that just to kind of show proof of concept so that it actually does do something. Um, and then when you click the shortcut OneDrive, if you look at it, um, I'm gonna, I, I think I edited it here. Um, when you look at the shortcut, all it's doing is writing another file to the desktop. And then you see the shortcut key there is shortcut space. You can't set a space through the editing. You have to do it through code. Uh, but once it runs, it writes another file to the desktop. That could have been your payload. That could have been anything you wanted. Um, this could have been a beacon. It could have been anything you really wanted. You could have had it delete it. Um, uh, but I, I do scroll up here. Uh, to show you kind of just some of the, the craziness that goes on with the channels behind the scenes. And so you'll see where it's writing. You'll also see the paths in there in the, in the, in the, the data. Um, and then the other thing that I show here 
is if it comes up, I probably should just skip this, but um, the clipboard. So, oh, so there's the file that it stole. So if it's, it found on the top line, it, it shows you the, uh, the secret file rogue RDP and it wrote it. So it found it on that map USB drive and, um, and the drive uh, just basically took it and was back to, oops, cancel that one. I almost left the uh, thing. And it just stole the file off there. Um, and so for the sake of time, I want to talk about um, some closing thoughts. And remediation. So it gets a little complicated because you can block RDP extensions for email, uh, but it's going to have to happen at this, you know, at the, the scale of the environment. So if an environment wants to deploy this using some sort of um, GPP, uh, you could do that, but is it going to interfere with business continuity? So that's one thing. But I would I would still encourage you know running some logistics and and trying to run some events to get a good lay of the land to see if that's something you could do. Uh, the other thing you could do is you could block out one out about thirty three eighty nine. <clears throat> Obviously, it's not going to change anything because you could change the port, but it'll make it a little bit more difficult uh, and at least give threat actors a little bit more of a headache. You can also set GPO policies, and this is one that I actually recommend. This is um, super important. You can set GPO to prevent the redirections of the disk drive. Um, and so there's all kinds of cool stuff in there that you can enable, uh, but by default, it's not enabled. So I, I strongly recommend getting in there, enabling these and deploying them across the environment. Now, you, you do need to be careful because if, a, if one of your employees is having to connect to a server, and they can't, you know, for some reason, save files locally. So you, you kind of want to work through those details um, and, and figure out what's best for your environment. The other thing you want to watch out for is the RDP COM objects. They're, they could be invisible. You could just see HTAs on network file shares or um, other places where you can instantiate COM objects that could be there. So you you kind of want to walk through that in your environment and do that. Another recent one, which um, I was going to bring up, but I'm not even going to bring it up, um, is Sigma rules. So Sigma released, uh, I think, four different new rules for Rogue RDP specifically. Uh, now, obviously, there's they're relatively new, so I, and, and, um, I really like what Sigma is doing. Uh, there's not a lot of people that are creating these detections and making them available, so I haven't released the bypasses for the Sigma rules yet, and I'm going to hold off on doing that for a while. Uh, some of them I already started looking through, and it's basically the Sigma rules are looking for process creation uh, for RDP files. And so there's there's some of that. There's other, uh, let's see, the other one was uh, watching RDP extensions. And so there's some cool stuff with just like execution that they're detecting on, on the endpoint for uh, RDP files directly. But I would consider this, there's some searching on Sigma. If you, I put it down there in the link for the slide deck uh, in case you, did my headphones die or did someone else's headphones die? I think I'm good. So uh, where Sigma, you could just search and see them. And, and that's pretty much the nuts and bolts. Uh, that is my QR code, I promise for Twitter. If you're not following me on Twitter, uh, it's all I ask. Just follow me on Twitter if you want to drop some stuff. I try to put all of my content through Twitter directly. I don't do the whole Mastodon stuff. Uh, but in a nutshell, that's what we got. Um, I'm going to open it up for some questions. I know there was some stuff in there I saw flying around, and hopefully so, I have answers. Mike, we have many, many, many questions. So we've got about 10 minutes left. We're going to go into Q&A. But for some of you, if you've got to jump to meetings or whatnot, oh, I'm going to put this in the wrong place here. Uh, you know, if you liked what you had here, and believe me, Mike, when you get a chance to look through the Discord, people liked what you have here. <laughs> and we've got lots of questions about it. But don't forget, uh, if you like this, join us for our webcasts every Thursday and Wednesday. But then also I'm putting links in the Discord right now for upcoming, uh, what we talked about in pre-show banner right at the top of the call, uh, the webinar, uh, our Blue Team Summit on August 23rd, and then also our um, our Wild West Hack and Fest. Plus, uh, Chris Trainer, as he dropped off, who was on in pre-show banter, he uh, is running a training class as well during the Blue uh, Blue Team Summit, his offensive tools training. I'd asked, hey, uh, 
uh, you know, who's who's going to be training and he couldn't come off mute quick enough because he had a baby on his lap, which was very cute. So please check us out there. So uh, at this point, we're going to go into Q&A. We have tons of questions. Uh, so let's start here. Anonymous attendee, and this was right around 122. Would this be considered a reverse shell? Would you would you think of this technique as a reverse shell? So it's certainly a reverse connection. I differentiate this not being a reverse shell from a reverse shell because reverse shell typically gives code execution directly and we're not really shelling it immediately. So depending on how you use it, if you're using it where you do um, get code execution, then it technically would be a reverse shell. You could, you could certainly leverage a reverse shell using RDP, if that makes sense. There is, uh, there is a way where if um, there, if you're using uh, the hypervisor, there's a certain hypervisor where you can get remote code execution through the printer. And so, uh, but it's been patched, so I didn't really talk about it. Um, but outside of that, I wouldn't consider it a reverse shell for that reason. Okay. Yeah, no, fair enough. Lord Zordak, uh, is there a valid use case for emailing an RDP file? Now, I think we talked about this, but I, I'm asked a question again. Because uh, you you talked about hey testing connectivity et cetera are there are there any other examples that you can think of? Um, so I see emails all the time in environments with RDP files. Not all the time. I see them a lot. If I'm going through email, I tend to find them if they're using RDP in the environment. Um, I see them using it on network file shares a lot as well. So if I'm on an internal, I'll look for hints of RDP files being shared that way, but um, I do think, to answer the question, I do believe that email is, gosh, it's it sucks because this is a legit business use. This is what we're doing. We're weaponizing legit okay. use cases. And, and I do think there is because they need to be able to share RDP files. I would say sharing it on a, a local file share and then linking to it probably be a better bet. But um, yeah, it's hard to say. I think there is a legit use though. Yeah. All right. So um, Blitz. What would the attack, MITRE attack mapping look like? Well, as James B jumped in, uh, you mentioned Sigma rules at the end. Um, have you looked at what this maps to in MITRE attack? No, I, I don't. So I don't. I don't play a lot on that side, and a lot of the remediations I do just without kind of the the MITRE attack references. Um, I'm a huge fan of MITRE attack. I just don't leverage it in an offensive security very often. Um, so I don't have that mapping. I would I would say check out the Sigma rules though because they may have some indicators in the metadata that reference the MITRE attacks. Uh, I do believe I've seen some references to um, some tags in the Sigma rules which will reference it, but I don't have them off the top of my head. Awesome. Probably like process creation or something like that. Yeah, and for for uh, Blitz who asked, I think it was Blitz that asked that question. I think James B responded to you in the Discord, and I, I kind of I kind of agree with that. Well, not kind of. I absolutely agree with what James said. So um, definitely check out what James put in there around the uh, MITRE TTPs. Uh, Char, so why RDP and not just the link file? At the end, you jump to the link file. Why why not just jump straight there? Yeah, because LNK files are typically blocked, right? So LNK files are a known technique that have been um, weaponized for, for many years. They're similar to like HTA files or um, ISO files and all of these. All these file extensions have been pretty much blocked by the majority. I like RDP because it bypasses everything. No one blocks it by default that I've seen unless there's been some changes since my research. Uh, and so they fly by everything. RDP files are um, are my just my go-to for that. So. Absolutely. All right. So uh, moving on through here, anonymous attendee. When you drop these files onto the victim machine, what would the parent process be? Would it just be an RDP process or the Citrix workspace processes? So it's not actually even the Citrix workspace. Um, that's just the roost that we're using. We're making it look like it's Citrix workspace so we could convince them to open it. Um, it's going to be the mstsc.exe file um, if we're leveraging it using just the direct RDP file. Because RDP by default, that extension opens and executes the mstsc process within built-in windows. And so that's what you're going to see. If they're using a com object, it's going to be a little bit different because your parent process might be Word or Excel or some sort of um, macro-enabled document. 
uh, or if an HTA, it's going to be the MS HTA. So you're going to see it from that perspective. And so um, that's the process that you're going to look for. Um, but bear in mind, if you're dropping binaries to the folder, just because you've prevented uh, it, MSTSC from going, they could have planted a binary file before your endpoint or detections caught the execution. So it might be too late. Um, and you just got to kind of see this on, on the speed there. Gotcha. All right. Uh, moving on through here. And Mike, do you have a hard stop or can we go a couple minutes long to answer yeah, some questions? Uh, I should be, I should be good. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, we're going to try and wrap it up pretty quickly here though, but lots of great questions, but I will have to stop taking them at some point. Uh, Hotel six. So in essence, this is having a user connect to your server via this RDP file. And because of how RDP works, that connectivity basically means the server quotes is able to interact with the OS of the connecting client. I think that's probably a decent summary, but would you agree? Yep. Completely agree. Perfect. Um, all right. Uh, anonymous attendee, would SSL decryption tools be able to detect the data exfiltration, the exfiltration in general? Would say that one more time. Would the SSL, SSL decryption? So if they broke the SSL connection in the middle from yep. you know, HTTP, uh, yeah. So the initial connection, um, yeah. So they're doing like um, SSL interception or something. Yeah. yeah well, I'm, I'm assuming a proxy or something like that, but I'm just inferring from the question. Yeah, so it's not, so it, de it depends, I would say on the environment. Um, from the server to the proxy, there's nothing they can do about it because that's on my controlled infrastructure. From the client to the proxy, yes, they should be able to uh, visibly see that traffic and um, and detect on, on maliciousness. Yeah. Got it, all right. Griffin Infosec, what if I'm, you? I loved this question because for a second when I read it, I'm like, what? And then I remembered that that exists. So Griffin Infosec, what if I'm using an RDP client from a Linux OS? So this um, was a great question. And I have some research going for Linux and Mac. And the man in the middle process still exists because we're talking about the RDP protocol. And so I've been testing it from my Mac currently. The only um, caveat to this is I am working out the rogue RDP uh, file system mappings because they're not currently working. However, you can still connect and get the connection information on Linux, Windows, and Mac. Very good. Awesome. No, that's that's crazy. Like I like I said, I had to remember. I'm like, oh yeah, I've used that. All right, Alan Cornell, uh, for the outbound to the man in the middle RDP, uh, I'm assuming that outbound port 3389, so the firewall for the egress on the victim network would need to allow that, correct? Now, I think you covered that, that you can avoid 3389, but do you want to maybe cover that again real quick? Yes. So it would, a lot of networks block 3389 outbound. The way that I bypass that is I set my man in the middle proxy to listen on a different port. And I pre configure the RDP file. You could tack on colon in the port to the host name. So let's say that it was uh, example.com was your uh, where you were having their client connect to your proxy server. Instead of example.com, it would be example.com colon 443. And then you would save the RDP file. So when that RDP file opens up, it's actually connecting over. Um, 443 instead of 3389. So it bypasses that um, that filtering. Right. Um, another anonymous attendee here. What do the contents of the RDP file look like after signing? Does it make any difference? Yeah, so it does. Actually, it's, uh, it's, it's a very good question. And the RDP so the RDP F RFC file. So if you if you're into reading RFCs, if you do any sort of research with technology, you probably are familiar with the RFC. Uh, but in the specifications for RDP, there's a number of settings that you can set up, um, and so those settings are basically key value pairs. And so that RDP file, if you create an RDP file, save it, and then open it in a, a regular text editor, you'll see a key and a value, a key and a value for all of the RDP settings. When you sign it. There's a line in the RDP file which tells the RDP or tells Windows these specific keys 
are signed, and then there's an encryption blob with um, the, the encryption, the encrypted signed data from the private key that you use to sign it, and that's stored within the RDP file. That way, if any of those keys ever get modified, it, it violates the integrity of that encryption blob at the bottom of the RDP file. And so that's how they're basically doing it. Nice. All right. So, uh, Gladiator. So, East, and I'm going to, they kind of wrote this in chunks. So I'm hoping that it's going to make sense to you because I'm reading through it and kind of trying to pick up on it. So, so, dot, 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 EC2 RDP over SSH but no password for user. Is there a secure mechanism for passwordless RDP over SSH on AWS EC2? Great question. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing what they're requiring, what they're saying EC2 and AWS are talking about the Windows server, running a Windows server in EC2. I'll address both. Yeah. Um, you could have the man in the middle proxy running on a Linux server in EC2 as well. So it's both applicable. Uh, keep in mind, if you use the, the man in the middle portion of this, you could send them directly to the server. Um, I don't recommend doing that. I recommend using the RDP man in the middle, like the Pi RDP software, because if you do it that way, you don't have to expose credentials anywhere. You could have any password that you want because it's your proxy that's connecting to your server that's doing the authentication. And their client is connecting to the proxy, but they don't need any passwords. It's it's forced logon. So you could literally not even put a username in that RDP file. They're never, they don't care about credentials. The only reason why we use credentials with the Windows server in EC2 is because we want our proxy server to connect to it and we have to have it for Windows. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it, there's, it's important to kind of differentiate that because you're connecting to yourself. You're just forwarding their traffic. And that's where I was saying it gets confusing on, you have to think of it, it's backwards, so. So we got about four more questions and we'll try and answer those real quick. So those who just submitted questions, we, we will have to wrap up at some point here. But Mike, would you be around later or at some point if people put some questions in Discord to go check? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So uh, going on then, anonymous attendees. So if the computer needs to restart, and I think this was talking during your the, during the space conversation, we're talking about your uh, peer at uh, CrowdStrike. Uh, so if the computer needs to restart, do you have code included to force a restart or crash? I'd imagine there's ton of tons of users that never reboot their machines. I mean, do you even need code to make Windows blue screen? I'm confused. No, anyway, moving on. Uh, so yeah, what about that? So I'm actively working on a technique um, to try to do that. Now, I haven't got it actually working, um, but what I was doing was trying, there's a debug mode within Windows where you could set some registry keys and you could trigger like a, a, a debug session blue screen. I've tried to get it to work, there's a keyboard sequence that you could do too. I think it's like control shift something something. So you set a registry key and then you do control shift and I forget what it exactly was. I think it was like left shift key. And uh, but, so I'm doing some research on it to try to trigger it. I haven't got it to actually work yet, but um, there is some built in Windows functionality to force the restart. I haven't got it working. But I would I would strongly encourage some research in this environment. I actually found it by going to Chat GPT and then posing as um, uh, an engineer looking for a way to do that, and um, and so it I, and then it would it would give me a way to do it, and I'd say not that way, give me another way, give me another way, and it was a cool little way to do it um, in order to try to restart it. Um, the reason why you can't use commands like shutdown or not my fault or any of those are because you don't have the ability to execute shutdown. Shutdown is a process that's in Windows. You can't run that process. That's what we need a shutdown for. We need to actually shut down and restart so that we can run execution of our process um, or our beacon or our payload. That's why we plant it in startup. Um, because if we plan it in startup, we can run it that way. If we plan it on a shortcut with an LNK spacebar, we can, but we have to wait for them to restart. We could also plant DLL files 
for side loading. That's what I was talking about in some of the code execution. And then they would have to run like Microsoft Teams and then we would get code execution. Um, so in order to do that, like setting, so the way that I was trying to research, this is a long winded answer, but it's a really, really important question to this technique. Setting registry keys we can do um, if we have like some access over the registry. Uh, because if we have like a macro, we could do some stuff. Uh, if we could write to the registry and then trigger like virtual keys being pressed. I tried it using C sharp, but C sharp was too high of a language. And there's like a virtual mapping to the actual Windows kernel. So then I went to C and did it in like just raw Win32 uh, API direct hardware, trying to get that key press to actually trigger. And they both didn't work. So we need some more research here. But I think it's something very valuable that that would make this technique um, super good. Agreed. Um, I love this question from Aaron Beardsley because it is it is I know a conversation of much internal debate when folks like you come up with crazy new techniques like this. Has Chris Brenton or anyone else at BHS ActiveSock looked at this this technique in AC Hunter? I believe, yes, we had some people last year. I was on an engagement. I think we did. Uh, I can't I can't remember. Yes, they are looking at it. I can't remember who, uh, which one of our threat analysts it was doing it. Uh, but there is there was some work on this. And um, yeah, it's definitely heads down. I know. And it's so funny because it's like, but it's it's the like, well, but I don't want to get chocolate in the peanut butter. It's like, well, we do red teaming, but we also do defensive stuff. Yeah, it's like, eh, well, yeah. uh, okay. Uh, Alan Murray, can the same thing be done for Citrix ICA as this leverages MSTSC RDP? And then they also kind of sent a second follow along question just in time there in conjunction with the previous question, Citrix ICA, how would SSL inspection affect connectivity? It's a different protocol and the default is to allow as opposed to block. Uh, two very good questions. Uh, on, on the SSL interception, obviously the traffic there, there's some stuff that you can do in order to, to kind of um, prevent this. Uh, I don't know anything right out of the box that, that makes it easy, uh, but I'm sure there are some pretty good environments out there that have some instrumentation that can kind of do some SSL inspection and, and stop this. Um, haven't found everybody to be well equipped stopping it so that's why i use it but uh the other thing on um, on the other question which was the citrix question i'm not familiar about that so there there could be some research in that area to see if it's if it's if citrix is connecting over mstsc then i suspect this could be leveraged for that i do if i had to guess which this is just an uneducated guess. This is not my realm for deploying technology for like remote workers and all that. I have no idea. I just weaponize it. All I do, and I'm not even really good at that. Um, what I would say is, I believe Citrix likely connects over some sort of RDP gateway. That's if I had to guess, because it's usually those remote environment software solutions that I've seen RDP gateway enabled. Um, so I don't know the answer to that, but I, if I had to guess, that's probably how. If it's using MSTSC um, and you can configure it to connect over the standard RDP protocol, it would be a phenomenal test to try. Um, I would love to try it. So I'd, if somebody wants to collab on some research that has an environment where we can do that, I'm totally down. Yeah, there you go. And remember, reach out to Mike on uh, Twitter at you stay ready, which uh, some other folks uh, who were apprehensive to to grab it in Discord put the link right in. Uh, I'm sorry, apprehensive from the QR code, put it in Discord, but it's on the screen as well. You stay ready uh, on Twitter. Uh, so reach out to Mike there. Um, last question here. Anonymous attendee, does Microsoft check the legitimacy of these signed RDP publishers in the same way that Apple does? Nope, not that I know of. I haven't seen it. I use some pretty sketch domains that are not categorized or nothing. I just, I buy a brand new domain, uh, register my brand new certificate and then roll with it. So nice. maybe All they right. should, but I mean, but the, I guess the hard part with that would be, you know, you'd have to get some, um, some signing keys that are verified from Microsoft, but then if, I don't know, it makes for a mess. I'm not sure that they would really even care much about that, but definitely should. So for the vote for the folks that are still on here, we got White Cyberduck, we got Kelly, we got Deb. Why don't you come off uh, camera real quick so we can all say goodbye, Mike? 
thank you so much for this. Um, we had so many comments in the Q&A from people that said, this is my first time showing up and these folks bring it. And Mike, you absolutely taught folks a lot of great stuff. So thank you for joining. Mm -hmm. 400 and it was like 450 a second ago, 412 people stuck around mm -hmm. for extra innings and Q&A. So thank you for taking the time out of your day to spend it with us. Uh, please join us on uh, additional webcasts. We have them on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And of course, I just put links in both the Discord and Zoom for our upcoming events, including Chris Trainer's uh, offensive tools class that'll be during our blue team summit on August 23rd. So if that's interesting to you, please uh, check it out. So for myself, Ian Meyer, uh, Ryan, uh, White Cyberduck, Deb, Mike, and Kelly, thank you for joining us on another BHIS webcast. And now I don't have to burn it down with fire because Ryan's back. Ryan. Ryan's going to do it. He's going it to with... kill it. Kill it. Kill it with fire, Ryan. Kill it with Ryan fire. Fire, <laughs> fire with Ryan sound. kill. Kill it. Kill it. Bye, guys. Bye. Kill it. Everybody. <laughs> Ryan, you're the worst. Bye.